This is a collection of my experiences revolving around the Blue Ridge Parkway. From the summer of 2002 until early 2004, I lived in a small town outside of Asheville, North Carolina. There wasn't much to do in the area on a Friday or Saturday night other than hang out with friends at the movies, go to the bar or pool hall, or, in our case, the scenic overlooks on the Blue Ridge Parkway. My group of friends' go-to meeting spot was one of the two overlooks off of the Blue Ridge Parkway. We would jump on the parkway off of the Tunnel Road, US 70, and drive about three miles north to the Hawk Creek Overlook, park our cars, and, depending on the weather, sit outside and just talk the night away. It may sound boring, but those nights were some of the best of my life, filled with laughter and pure joy. It's where we went to decompress from our early 20s stress-filled days. We would usually meet up there any time between 9 to 11 p.m. and not depart until well past 2 a.m., often ending our nights at the nearby Waffle House. Depending on the time of year, the Overlook would get busy with other groups of friends doing the same as us. Romantic dates, nature enthusiasts either camping out in their cars or returning from or embarking on hikes. On certain occasions, Hawk Creek Overlook would be too crowded for our liking, so we would just proceed to the next Overlook, which was Tanbark Ridge. That was almost always nearly empty. It was in these areas that my friends and I experienced truly paranormal and possibly demonic experiences. On most nights, they would come and go without any of the normal events to speak about. That slowly changed. On certain nights, there could be as many as six of us hanging out on the Overlook, other nights only two. On one particular night, and the first Blue Ridge Parkway experience that I can recall, we were standing and talking near the back of my car while we smoked a cigarette, facing the road, the parkway. We were the only car at the second overlook, Tanbark. When we weren't talking with each other, it would get quieter than quiet up there. The whole night we kept hearing what sounded like conversations or voices coming from the side of the mountain across from where we gathered. It wasn't uncommon for there to be night hikers or campers in the area, but these voices were not coming from an area that was known for trails or camping. As we were standing near the back of my car, we all heard the voices, louder than before this time. At first it was from our left, then immediately from our right, and then finally straight in front of us. The voices, although rather loud, were unintelligible. We couldn't make out what they were saying. It was almost like gibberish or some kind of made-up language. We were all expecting to see someone by how close in proximity the voices were, but there was nobody around us. No car had even passed the overlook for a while. We wrote it off as having to be hikers conversing somewhere on the mountain, and their voices somehow carrying or being projected through the woods in some weird acoustical thing. For weeks after, we told the story to our other friends and co-workers, who would all share similar accounts with us. That was the start of many more strange and sinister occurrences. Simultaneously with the strange events that I experienced on the Blue Ridge Parkway, my family and I were also experiencing paranormal activity at the house we were renting in Swananoa. I wondered at the time if the occurrences were related in any way, which as time went on and more events happened, I don't think they were connected at all. The night that I believe triggered a string of events was a Saturday after work. Before heading to the first overlook, I stopped and picked up my friend, and we proceeded to get on the Blue Ridge Parkway. About halfway up from the entrance to the Blue Ridge Parkway and on the first overlook, we noticed a pickup truck three quarters of the way into the woods, off of the road, with only its interior dome light on, and a man returning to the truck with a shovel in his hand. My friend and I instantly got creeped out by this peculiar sight, and half-jokingly both said that the guy was probably hiding a body. Later that night, when we were leaving the Blue Ridge Parkway, I drove past that exact spot where we had seen the truck and the man earlier. I nearly drove off the road, as my dome light in my car turned on and nearly blinded me. It's dark on the Blue Ridge Parkway, 
No lights at all. Almost gave me a heart attack. The light was on for maybe a second or two, and then it shut off. I'm generally a level-headed and rational person, but at that moment, I was shook. My friend was equally in shock, and we both calmed ourselves down. When we got to his house, we sat in his driveway and tried to make sense of it. That light only turns on if you open a door. We did not open a door. That light had never once turned on for any other reason before that. After I dropped off my friend, I had to drive under the Blue Ridge Parkway bridge on my way back home. As I passed under the bridge, my light again turned on. But this time, it flickered a few times and then stayed off. In my opinion, this was now past the point of coincidence. That was not the last time that my light went off in my truck, for a span of a few months. Not every time, but almost. The light would come on or flicker near that spot on the Blue Ridge Parkway where we saw the man and his truck. One of my friends who was driving behind me one night saw the light go off from her car, and it scared her so badly that she did not return to the Blue Ridge Parkway at night anymore. On one night, three of us gathered at the first overlook. It had rained a lot the day before and that morning. On the opposite side of the overlook, there was a sheer rock wall that ascended about a hundred feet. There was enough moonlight to see the water trickling down the rock wall. It was my friend that was riding with me when we saw the man that noticed that the water coming down the rock wall appeared to resemble a person's head, tilted sideways. I agreed, and so did our other friend. But as more water ran down, it looked like it formed a rope around the person's neck. And as time went on, more water rolled down, and the person resembled a girl. It was almost too clear, like somebody was purposefully creating this effect. We started to concoct ideas that perhaps that man did do something bad in those woods and maybe the light flickering and the water on the rocks was a calling of sorts. I had disabled the light in my truck from going off. It still went off a handful of times after that, which should have been impossible. But the cherry on top of it all was on the night that I was the last one of my friends to leave the overlook. As I drove down to leave the Blue Ridge Parkway, again near that spot, my front driver's side tire blew out. I pulled over on the shoulder of the road and tried to call one of my friends, but I didn't have cell reception. If it wasn't that I had to be at work in the morning, I probably would have just slept in my car until there was light, but that was not an option. I proceeded to get out and change my tire in the pitch black night. I felt so vulnerable, and although nothing happened, I felt as if I wasn't alone. I felt that at any moment, something, I don't know what, would occur to scare the living shit out of me. But nothing did. Until I got back in my car and started pulling back onto the road. At that moment, my light again flickered, and I swear I instantly felt my right side of my body get about 30 degrees colder. The next day, my friend and I called in anonymously to the Asheville PD and reported what we had seen in the woods, the truck and the man. Obviously, we did not mention any of the paranormal events that had occurred after that. We felt as if we had to say something, but for the longest time we weren't sure what or how to. We hadn't heard of any disappearances or murders in the area. But then again, in my early 20s, I wasn't an avid reader of the paper or watcher of the local news. These events all happened around spring to late fall. We stuck to the bars and pool halls for months after those events until early the following year. We finally decided to venture back to the Blue Ridge Parkway more frequently. My friend and I, the same friend, were starting a new band and the Blue Ridge Parkway was a great place to collaborate and write songs. One night, and my last night ever spent on the Blue Ridge Parkway, we took up an acoustic guitar to help finish writing a song. That night, both overlooks were crowded, so we drove to this little cut right off the road just past the first overlook. We settled there and propped open the tailgate of my GMC Jimmy. We were up there for a couple of hours, probably around one to two in the morning at this point, when we start hearing straight up laughing coming from the woods and the tree line close to the car. We stopped what we were doing and just froze and listened. The laughing stopped 
and we heard what sounded like a horse snarl, followed by a whisper. We heard a laugh again, and finally, we hear somebody go, Psst. We immediately closed my tailgate, jumped in the car, and drove down to the first overlook. At this point, it had cleared out, and there were no other cars there. I pulled into the overlook with my car still facing the road, not pulled into a parking spot. We had no idea what those sounds that we had just heard were or what they'd come from. It just didn't make any sense. At the overlook, my friend got out of the car to relieve himself. We both lit a cigarette and decided to head back to the car as it started to rain a little bit. Just before we got back, we heard what sounded like a gallop or horse hooves getting louder from the area we'd just left. I had a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach and I had an overwhelming feeling to just get the fuck out of there, and so did my friend. Without saying anything to each other, we ran and jumped into my car to leave. As I turned over the key and started the car, I happened to look back, and that's when I saw an image that to this day I will never forget. I saw what looked like a tall, goat-like man. I distinctly saw horns as it began to run full speed toward the car. I didn't look back again, and I drove like a bat out of hell from that area. My friend didn't look back, but he heard the galloping getting louder and closed his eyes. Neither one of us has ever returned to that area at night again. I moved away from North Carolina in 2004. My friend still lives in the area. However, to this day, he does not go up onto the Blue Ridge Parkway at night. He only visits during the day. When we get together, we can't help but talk about all the shit we saw and experienced during that time. We always talk about one day returning to that area at night again. Even though we're scared to death, the curiosity of the unknown draws me. And we both have questioned why those things occurred to us. And we want answers. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. 
While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. 
We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose and open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry.
On May 9th of this year, I went to a flea market to browse. I passed by a clear cabinet that held an assortment of old antique dolls, and I was particularly drawn to an old cracked doll wearing a hat with feathers. As I examined her closer, I noticed that she had a cloth body, but her arms, head, and legs were made of some type of plastic or possibly porcelain. I felt very drawn to her and was surprised by her price, only $35. She wasn't in very good condition and is clearly rather old based on the cracks in her body and the way her face is painted on. I returned to the cashier with the doll and immediately the workers who had been deep in conversation halted and fell quiet. They proceeded to tell me a little more about the doll who supposedly hexes anyone who inconveniences her. This only made me feel more inclined to purchase her. As someone who is very interested in the paranormal and it being part of my faith as a Wiccan, I wanted to see more, so I ended up buying her. My younger sister, who's 11, wasn't very happy that I had bought the doll, whose name was Madame Leonora. She felt very thrown off by the doll's presence and requested that the doll be placed in the trunk on the ride home. I didn't want to upset the doll just in case I did get hexed, but my parents insisted that I put the doll in the trunk, so I did. That same day, I almost went to the hospital after an accident at my home. Similar disturbing events happened around the home whenever someone insulted Madam or did something she didn't like. These events pose a possible trauma trigger for some people, so I won't specify what they are. Just know that they were very serious and very awful. I began giving Madam gifts and saying good morning and good night to her every day. On the first day that I gave her a gift, a package I hadn't been expecting for another two weeks came in the mail. Every time I give her a gift, she gives me good luck. Madam and I had formed a friendship, but toward late June, I began having strange, very specific dreams. In these dreams, Madam would climb down off the shelf she lives on and escort me outside. We would light candles and perform a ritual, and then I would bury Madame in a box with the gifts that I had given her over the months. As soon as the dream ends, I wake up. So, with the knowledge I have because of my Wiccan faith, I decided to hold a seance of sorts in order to communicate with the spirit hosting my doll. I lit a candle and used a pendulum with a board to communicate. The candle flame responded to everything I said, and I've never seen such clear responses through my pendulum before. Based on what I got out of the session, Madam was able to tell me that she would like to be buried, but won't reveal to me why. I've never sensed any negative energy around Madam before, but with each passing day, the air in my room feels heavier, if that makes any sense. I'd like to fulfill her wish and bury her, because I think she might be a Victorian mourning doll, but the vendors who sold her have no information on her, only that she makes bad things happen. If she is indeed a Victorian mourning doll, it would make sense why she wants to be buried. The only problem is, she won't tell me why I have to do it. If anyone can tell me if there are any dangers in burying her, if there's anything I should know about this, or if there's anything I can do to identify what time period she's from, I would really appreciate the help. Update I woke up this morning and was pleasantly surprised by the amount of attention and responses that I had received. I want to go through some more information on my experience with the paranormal, some events that have occurred while Madame has been in my home, and what I'll be doing with Madam based on research and the advice from the community, as well as trusted psychic mediums. To begin, I have been working with the paranormal for 10 years now. When my mother introduced it to me after she noticed my sensitivity to haunted places and objects, it became a part of my life. The first experience I ever had was very young in the first home I ever lived in. 
It began when I started noticing shadowy figures around my home, and items would fall off the shelves or get lost. My mother came home one night with her sister after a ghost hunt in an abandoned buffalo jail, I believe. I didn't know where they had been, only that I had noticed a shadow enter our home behind them. I explained what I had seen, and that is when my journey into Wicca began. Not long after this experience, my mother decided to take me on a ghost hunt in St. Augustine. We went to the famed haunted lighthouse there. Throughout my journey, I felt a tugging toward a specific window, and was later told that a woman was often seen in that very window. I felt hands on my back and shoulders the entire time I was there, and my shoes kept coming untied. I was little then, so that first experience scared me for a long while, until I felt a pull toward a shop in Gettysburg while we were visiting on vacation. We bought some equipment to communicate with spirits near the Saxe-covered bridge, and while I was there, three spirits came into contact with me. A Confederate soldier, a Union soldier, and a little girl who had died in the house on the property. Each one connected with me through my emotions, and they expressed to me the pain they felt when they died. All of them didn't want to pass on, either for fear of the afterlife or the unwillingness to let their past life go. I returned to Gettysburg three times, and each time the spirits would connect with me and talk to me about their lives. After my first experience in Gettysburg, I decided to speak with two psychics, and both told me they believed that I was an empath. I embraced this after some research, and ever since, spirits have been twice as drawn to me. They come to me with their problems, and I do the best I can to resolve them. I never wanted to conform to a specific faith because of my many different beliefs about the afterlife, the paranormal, and anything spiritual until I found Wicca. Most of what I believe aligns well with the faith. So I began my practice with it and found that I love every part of it. The reason for my brief stories on my experiences is just to ease the minds of some people who believe me to be inexperienced. I do appreciate the concern though. It's lovely to know that people have my back and are urging me to be careful because I wholeheartedly agree that safety is 100% necessary when communicating with any spirit. To add on to that, I noticed that many people were denouncing Madam, calling her a demon. I would like to ease the minds of people who believe Madam to be a demon. Madam has never physically harmed anyone in this household. Let me explain jinxes, hexes, and curses. A jinx is like a practical joke. It's really just a nuisance of a spell that's gone very quickly. They're practically a mosquito in your life. A hex is a mildly inconveniencing spell meant to dissuade the hexed person from engaging in acts that the spellcaster does not condone. In Madame's case, she only hexes people who disrespect her, and the hex is gone within a day. They take up a lot of her energy. Hexes are moderately complex, and I've never had any issues lifting them before. A curse is a harmful spell, meant to damage the person it's directed at. Curses are difficult to lift and often cause physical harm to the person they're directed at. So, with that in mind, know that Madame has never done anything physically harmful, and I don't believe she ever will. Her hexes consist of mild loss of money, misplaced important objects, emotional disturbances, dizziness, irritation, and items falling. Many of you were concerned about my younger sister. I would like to let you know that Madame has never harmed her in any way. Madame and my sister get along quite well, and my sister is no longer wary of her. My parents had hexes placed on them after they disrespected Madame, but after they apologized, they were lifted. No one has been hexed in over a month now. Let me put this into perspective for you. You're a confused person who's just been brought into a new home with people who are continuously disrespecting you. You're angry, yes? No one enjoys being disrespected. So, since this was Madame's situation, she lashed out and caused some disturbances to get our attention and let us know that she does not want to be disrespected or ignored. 
Madam hadn't received much kindness until she came into my home, and after a couple of weeks, she was very much at ease. She doesn't expect to be given gifts, but if she receives them, she reciprocates kindness in the form of good luck. So with that in mind, you can also make note that I don't believe Madam to be a demon. Demons often, but not always, please do your research on demonology, have malicious intent toward the residents of a home. Demons also are less likely to attach themselves to an object, and would rather attach themselves to a person. There's a difference between a demon and an angry spirit. An angry spirit needs an issue to be resolved, while a demon preys on people simply for the reason of being negative, to feed off of the harm that it causes. I've also received the comment that I don't need to know the reason Madam would like to be buried, and to an extent, I agree. Madam suffered a painful, tragic death at a young age, and because of this, her reasons for burial could be very personal. I'm glad she trusted me enough to come to me about her request. I won't push her for a response on why she'd like to be buried. I'd rather just follow through with the request. So, with all of this said, I am going to bury Madam. I will not be burying her at my home, so in case something goes wrong, she doesn't attach herself to my home. Tonight is a full moon, so I'll be working with Madam in my dreams tonight to find out if there is anywhere specific she would like to be buried. I'll be salting the ground where I bury her, and I'm going to make potions to seal off the area. I have enough flowers, herbs, and crystals for protections, along with some oils, incense, candles, and pentagrams. And please don't tell me that pentagrams are demonic, because they're not. I'll be working with a sister witch during the burial as well, as an extra safety measure. I cannot verbally express how happy I am that so many people were willing to help Madam, and believe me, she's even more pleased than I am. The whole house feels very light today, and the animals have been extra happy. I'm in awe of the kindness that we've both received, and I'm glad you all decided to help. I have always enjoyed the paranormal for entertainment, but kept with me a healthy dose of skepticism when it came to real life stories. Growing up, my mother was very much into the supernatural or anything paranormal. Psychics, ghosts, the afterlife, you name it. This instilled in me from a very young age, a skeptical outlook on things of this nature. Instead, I would learn how psychic and paranormal experts fake evidence or cold read and things of this nature to basically debunk my mom, although I was always entertained by her stories on some level. She would always tell me stories about my supposed gift to communicate with ghosts from a very young age, and how my family members refused to babysit me because I creeped them out too much. I also have a lot of memories of being young and strange, unexplainable and downright creepy things happening to me all the time. But I would cope with it by justifying how there must be some logical explanation, such as sleepwalking or just my overactive child's mind or something. There is one experience though that always stuck with me that I witnessed as an adult. I wouldn't say it changed my mind, but there is something about this I cannot let go of or rationalize away. I even get a little bit emotional and start to tear up a little when I think about it today, which is unlike me. I am now 28 years old, but when I was 21, I worked in a four-star hotel and spa named Earth Castle in Scotland, located just outside of Stirling, where many of the bloody and violent wars Scotland is historically known for took place. This is a real place, and already has a reputation for being haunted. I want to tell you my experiences of working in this hotel, and the strange events I experienced while working there. To give context, the hotel is made up of two main buildings. The first is a new building, a typical hotel where the guests stay with luxury dining and spa, etc. The other building is the castle itself, 
which is mainly only used for weddings, and one time Sean Penn stayed with us while filming a movie. That was pretty cool. I worked as a kitchen porter. My job was to wash dishes, clean up, basically all the kitchen duties which didn't involve cooking, to allow the chef to focus on preparing the food. Whenever there was a wedding that needed to be catered for, some of us would be sent up to the castle to work there. Eventually, I refused to work in the castle. Of course, the staff there knew about the castle's reputation and would tell each other stories about what they had heard. In my skeptical mind, I simply rationalized it as local entertainment and just got on with my work. One of the most frequent occurrences that would be reported is that whenever guests would stay in the castle, they would phone the front desk in the main building and tell us that they could hear children playing and running around and ask if we could send somebody up to deal with the children. There never were any children in the building. The castle was always reserved for the bride and groom to have the place to themselves. I cannot stress how common this complaint was. Almost everyone who stayed in the castle reported the same story of being disturbed by the sounds of children playing in the hallways. Sometimes, late at night, I could hear the running coming from the upstairs balcony in the central room of the castle. If I was ever brave enough to go investigate, it would stop. The basement floor of the castle has been turned into a few guest rooms and a storage space for the staff to use. It looked like any other floor of a hotel, not the creepy basement of a castle that you might expect. There are reports that this floor is haunted by a groundskeeper, and I also have a few stories about people telling me about a phantom dog they could hear barking. I never encountered either of these spirits, but the reason that I'm mentioning it is that the basement floor of this castle especially terrified me. Every time I was there, I felt the most uncomfortable feeling, like when people tell you that they feel like someone's watching them. That entire floor gave me the most uneasy feeling, as if I could feel someone breathing down my neck or I was surrounded by something. I was never able to go down there without feeling stiff and having the most horrible feeling of dread come over me. It's hard to put into words. I hated going down there. If you stand outside the castle facing it, there's a dining room just to the left of the entrance on the ground floor. In this room, there's an enormous painting of a woman. I forget who she is, a wife of the commander or something who lived there. This painting was also especially creepy. She has such a stern look on her face, which I guess was common for that era and style. Very regal looking. There were a lot of unexplained noises that came from the area this painting is located in, like knocking, banging, things like that. One time, a group of us were standing in that room commenting on how depressing the painting looked only to be interrupted by a slow scratching noise that went all the way from the top to the bottom of the 10 foot high wall that the painting was hanging on. Old castles like this do not have hollow walls, not like a loose piece of stone could have been falling inside, which was my first thought. We could never figure out where this noise came from. The most frightening moment inside that castle happened one night during a wedding. The chefs had finished with their jobs and had taken everything back down to the main building. I was left in the kitchen to finish washing up and cleaning. The guests had left and the bride and groom were, well, it's not my business what they were up to, but they were off in their suite. The only other people in the castle were a few remaining waitstaff also finishing tidying up. I went out the side door to the castle to have a cigarette. The southwest corner of the kitchen was the entrance to the kitchen. The southeast corner was the washing up area where I was working. And the northeast corner was a passageway to a small room where we kept plates, cutlery, and a walk-in fridge. When I came back into the kitchen after finishing my cigarette, I could hear someone working in the back room, moving cutlery around and stacking plates the normal sounds of someone else working, so I paid no attention to it and got back to washing dishes. After a few minutes, I heard the working sounds from the other room stop, and the room fell silent for a while. It sounded like nobody was moving, which I thought was strange. 
Another piece of information that you need to know is that another one of the girls I worked with and I would play this game where we would try to creep up on each other and scare the other person. When the sounds of the working stopped, there was an unusual silence. So I figured, aha, this is that girl and she's about to try to scare me. My plan was to continue working like normal. And then when she jumped out to try to scare me, I would be just as cool as a cucumber and be like, nice try. I waited for a full minute and she never jumped out. I waited for a second minute, still nothing. Thinking she was just really committed to this joke, I went to investigate. I walked into this room and nobody was there. I cannot describe how hard my heart jumped when I walked into the room to find it empty. I started questioning my own sanity and kind of freaking out. I definitely heard someone working back there for a good 30 to 60 seconds before it stopped. The workstations the chefs used formed kind of an alley you had to walk through to get out of the kitchen. Nobody could have left that kitchen without walking directly by me washing dishes. And since I was on high alert, I definitely would have noticed somebody leaving. The incident really freaked me out. I had to leave the building for a while and I really didn't want to go back in to finish my shift. Another time, I was working in the same kitchen and the night security guy came through looking confused and told me to follow him. This security guy also had more than his fair share of creepy stories while walking around this building at night, but back to that in a minute. He took me through to a room at the back, which had a small bar and was used to entertain the wedding guests sometimes. This room was not in use that night. He asked me to tell him if I could smell anything. Upon stepping into the room, I immediately was hit with an overwhelming smell of cigar smoke. He insisted that nobody had been using this room and the guests had left a while ago. Apparently, this room was previously used as the aforementioned commander's study, where he would draw up battle plans and spend time alone. Since I was normally working quite late, I knew this night security guy pretty well. We talked about all the creepy stuff that we had both encountered in the castle, and he was insistent that it was not just stories. He began telling me of all his stories and just how commonly they occurred, after all, he was the guy who had to go check the castle out every time a guest complained about the children running around. He told me that his encounters were so frequent and impossible to ignore that he had begun to do deep research into the history of the castle and its previous inhabitants. Apparently, there were two children who had died in a fire there once, the children of the woman in the painting in the dining room. Their nanny had run back into the building to try to save them and was also killed in the fire. The night security guy told me that he had personally taken a photograph of the castle and in one of the upstairs rooms, slightly left of the entrance, you could clearly see a nanny with two children standing in front of her, looking out the window at him. Although shaken from other strange experiences, my rational, skeptical mind was still there. He was a tall, slim man in his 40s, spent a lot of time alone, walking around a castle, investigating disturbances constantly. I figured he might have been exaggerating or making it up just for a good ghost story. But the next day, he brought in the photo and showed me. In the upstairs window, just like he said, were two children and their nanny looking directly out the window, clear as day. I don't know if that man still works there or not, but he owns a picture that will give you the creeps. He doesn't seem to have put it online anywhere. I looked. If anyone from Earth Castle reads this, and a man matching that description still works there as a night security guard, tell him I'm looking for that picture. Once he showed me this photo, that was the last time I was ever in that castle. Every time a wedding was happening, I would refuse to go cater for it. I'm not going, send someone else, I would say. Eventually, I was fired from that job because the manager and I would frequently fall out over this. But honestly, I don't care. I never wanted to go near that place again. 
Despite keeping my skepticism, I admit there was something about that place that just wasn't right. I will remember that job and that castle until the day I die. Just thinking about being back in that building gives me the creeps. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal, my alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that, and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock, and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55, and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning, and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about 7, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had street lights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, and the far off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, Nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about ten feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. 
I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor, whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on, showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time, and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, but I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out, I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically, I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane, in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, some she tells us about, others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, 
and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the sun was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down, and that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common, and even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine. I just want to mention a few key points before I share some of the things that happened. I am not looking for attention. Everything contained within this story is 100% factual. I'm an Australian, and these occurrences happened on the central coast of New South Wales. I am an avid outdoorsman with a keen interest and in-depth knowledge of Australian native fauna. Each of these occurrences have a witness apart from myself. I don't claim these events are paranormal, yet I am, to this day, still without a reasonable explanation. Occurrence number one. I live on the New South Wales central coast in an area that has houses in close proximity to Brisbane Water National Park, literally within meters from some back fences. Myself and my partner hold a keen interest which sees us venture into the bushland regularly for argument's sake, let's say we are avid bird watchers. A few weeks ago, the local fire service commenced backburning in parts of the Brisbane Water National Park over two days or so, which was obviously for hazard reduction. Most of the fire was directed at burning off leaf litter and dry debris, which covers the ground, in an effort to reduce the chances of spot fires, 
which have in the past become large fires and threatened houses and caused neighboring suburbs to be evacuated. Because of the way the back burning was controlled, it completely burned off the debris and basically 90% of flora that was over two or so feet seemed to have survived, except for some light charring, of course. Even some grass plants survived while others were completely burned, including their underground roots, which left large round circles in the substrate. This meant that the canopy was fully intact, and this is an important point to the story. The fire was controlled so well that the left-hand side was completely obliterated by fire while the right-hand side was untouched. The path is about three to four feet wide at its widest points. Anyway, about 48 hours after the fire service had finished back burning, my partner and I ventured into a large patch of Brisbane Water National Park along a track that we have walked no less than 200 times in the last decade. The first thing we noticed, of course, was the lack of small shrubs and ground cover, which had been replaced by a three to four centimeter layer of ash. It was also hard not to notice the smell and non-visible smokiness, which irritated our throats and noses. But by far the most profound thing we noticed was just how quiet it was. Usually we hear birds chirping, snakes slithering into the underbrush, lizards scampering out of the way, and ducks splashing around in the creek that runs along the whole length of the walking track on the right. Across the creek, there are literally kilometers of bush in all directions, so it was a little odd that it was so desolate, even after backburning. We decided to press on, even though we were pretty sure that we weren't going to see any wildlife. We continued along the track for another 20 minutes or so, all the while chatting about nothing in particular. When all of a sudden, we both jerk our heads to the left to see two vertical vines which stand at about six feet tall and four centimeters or so in circumference come toward us like they've been shook, held back and released, sort of like a slingshot. We immediately run over to the trees, four meters or so off the track, because we thought it might have been caused by wildlife. My first instinct was to look up as it may have been a large bird fleeing, but there were no birds at all in any of the trees, and we would have seen and heard the wings flapping and it breaking through the canopy. It wasn't any type of guanas, we've only had two types which occur naturally here, and both are arboreal and will take to the nearest tree when threatened. We checked every tree, every hollow log and any type of ground cover which survived the fire and found nothing. It definitely wasn't any type of marsupial, because it would have been spotted when we checked the trees and surrounding ground cover. It also wasn't any type of snake, as the only arboreal snake we have locally which weighs in kilos is the diamond python, which I could spot from a mile away. We continued walking for another three kilometers or so along the track, and the whole time felt like we were being watched. I was quite uneasy, but that feeling completely left as soon as we turned around and backtracked and headed toward home. Occurrences 2 and 3 My partner and I went out on another adventure, but this time we were looking for nocturnal animals to photograph. We went to a waterfall, which was only about 15 minutes from our house, but is rather secluded and completely dead at night and on weekdays. Funnily enough, it becomes packed on the weekends, during the day in the warmer months. The layout of the waterfall is basically a large parking lot at the stop of the waterfall, which has a small park with barbecues, tables, and a small block of toilets. From the parking lot, you can also access the very top of the waterfall, which is basically a rock escarpment with water running through it. You can also access stairs that take you down to both the middle of the waterfall, which is just a huge rock platform, and the very bottom of the waterfall. It takes about 20 minutes to walk from top to bottom. We parked the car and I grabbed my gear, which included my camera. We start making our way toward the top of the falls, which has a two-foot barrier you have to step over to access the rock escarpment. Right as I went to put my leg over the fence, I heard the most disturbing noise I've ever heard. 
It sounded like a human, moaning in pain, but to describe it the best I can, imagine having 10 different people with 10 different voice qualities, all making the same moaning sound at the same time. I'm not one to frighten easily, but I have to admit, it sent chills up my spine. I told my partner to hurry up and get back to the car, and I locked the doors as soon as we got in and left in a hurry. Now, this place is pitch dark. There are zero lights, and there's no way in hell you'd be there without a torch. Not to mention, you would be able to tell if anybody was there by the cars parked in the parking lot, as this is not a place that you would walk to. When I told a close friend of mine, who also frequents the waterfall to photograph wildlife, he told me that he also had an experience the night before, which was the night after I was there. He had finished work late and thought he'd go for a quick walk around to see what he could find. This was in the Australian spring, when everything is out and about due to the warm and humid weather. He said he had parked his car and got about halfway down the stairs to the bottom of the falls when he came across a snake. He was photographing it when he heard the door of the toilet block being slammed repeatedly. He started running up the steps to get back to his car and said as he was running up, it sounded like something was going mental, slamming things within the toilet block. He got in his car and left. My friend and I decided to go check out the waterfall that night to see if we could find anything. We parked the car and went straight to the toilet block. We checked the block that he had heard the commotion from and found a reasonably large amount of blood inside the basin and a small pool in the basin's soap dish. We contemplated calling the police but weren't sure exactly what we would report. We left soon after and neither of us visited the place for over a month. Since then we've been back to this place multiple times without any incident. Occurrence number four, the last occurrence. Now on to last night. We headed out along a road on the central coast, which by day is rather busy due to the high number of residences and farms that are along this road, but by night is usually very quiet, with a few cars using it sporadically, so I have my high beams on 95% of the time. We drove along this road for about 40 minutes in search of marsupials to photograph. This road intersects large masses of bush on both sides. I would also like to add at this point that this road is not straight or level by any means. There's a mixture of turns as well as slight to aggressive inclines and declines along basically the entirety of this road. After driving for 40 minutes without any luck, we decided to head back along the same route we'd taken. We were driving for about 10 to 15 minutes on our way back when we hit one of the very slight gradual inclines along the road. When we were about halfway up the incline, I noticed something in the distance, maybe 200 to 250 meters or so, which I initially thought was a shadow being cast from residual lighting of my high beams. All of a sudden it moved from the middle of the road to the right side. At this point, and while the figure was still in motion, I asked the passenger, and the person who's been present for the last three unexplained experiences, can you see that? To which they replied, yeah, what is that? We got to the top of the incline and onto level ground once again and stopped in the location that we saw it. I stopped and I pulled out one of my torches and surveyed where we'd seen it. To my surprise, where it had crossed to was a small property which was essentially a house with a very small paddock with horses out in the front. But what caught my attention was that the horses were not startled in the slightest and could actually see one of them close to the fence, calmly eating. After about two minutes of surveying the area, I continued along the road and asked my passenger exactly what they had seen. They relayed exactly what I had seen. A tall, six-ish foot but with about two and a half foot wide profile but rounded figure. It was very hard to gauge an exact height because since we were on an incline, the perspective was a little off. For instance, say a person was to walk in that exact spot, we would only be able to see them from the knees up due to the blind spot on the summit. My passenger added another piece of information, which was that it was rusty colored. 
I couldn't make out a color, but I have to admit that I was not paying as much of attention to it as I was the road. I was going at about 70 kilometers an hour, so I really had to focus on driving while also trying to get to the summit as quickly as possible to see what it was. I would also like to add another detail, which I find is rather strange. While I couldn't see the figure's complete leg area, it didn't seem to be walking in a normal fashion. It's almost like it was gliding across the road. I know that seems odd. If I had to liken the body shape to a known animal, it would definitely without a doubt be an orangutan, but standing a fair bit taller and not as hunched in the lower back area. So there you have it. I no longer live in that area. I now live 40 minutes north of there, but I still visit often due to having family there. I would like to point out that all of these incidents happened within about a six week period, which all seemed to start with the hazard reduction back burning. Australian summers are harsh. I've not had any weird happenings since then, and I still spend a ridiculous amount of my time out in the bush. I also work in a scientific field. I work with wildlife, so I know which animals are endemic to Australia, and I know that what I saw is not. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school, over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you, I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my boyfriend's house at the time, which took roughly 15 minutes, so let's say about 10.45 at night. I was full of energy at this age, and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. In fact, I was hyped up with the warm summer nighttime breeze, car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through the back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its cops. They could be jerks. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat, so I could really speed and that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I would take a right turn, which was more than 90 degrees, almost back the way I had come from. Then, in exactly a half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road, where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much, because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel, and it would have been a waste as I would have just had to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where this all went down. A house had recently been built there, two stories with a detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected. We built our family house and it took us a year to finish it. I'll start at the beginning because I believe that this is all related. Week one. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along when my lights illuminate something stunning sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf. A real wolf. A solid white real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and I've even met a quarter wolf in person. They look different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and just blowing my mind. 
I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it. And I notice that it's not minding me at all. It's sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking. Its ears didn't even flick toward me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to behave like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric, like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Native American stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I had gotten to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week two, I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolf buddy, hoping to see him again around that area. So I drove extra slowly with my window down and my radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. Then I saw the... the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity, my reality, and the possibility of eldritch terrors as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox, its limbs folded and pulled in tight, with its hunched posture. Yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black, with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor-sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated, with barely more than frog-like thin skin, pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright. And at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulk to them and looked equipped for running, with the back-facing knees for sprinting and tipped in raptor-like curved claws, it also looked emaciated. It looked tall, maybe seven feet or more, just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes, solid black and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. I knew it was going to happen. I knew that it was going to look at me. It was going to see me and there was nothing I could do to avoid it. Panic and a terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world. The world that I had always known and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up, or I would be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car and I would become an unsolved mystery. I knew it in the core of my being. I had a manual crank window. Why, you might ask? Because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car. But at that moment, I realized that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning toward me, and I had to let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I just knew I had to get that window up first. I was cranking it as hard as I could. I started to cry as I finally got the window closed. And then I put my gas pedal to the floor, gravel road be damned. 
I thought to myself, I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make any direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I had already seen too much. My tires had found grip and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed, I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see the darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick that I had learned before to tap my brakes softly enough that the light came on, but not so hard that I actually slowed down. It's a way to see behind you in the dark. Red lit up the dust that was billowing my way, but amidst the swirling chaos, I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest, a tall, thin shadow. I had had enough and decided that I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 109 miles per hour, which is fast as I can go before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a ride onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, nobody was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time. So I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain it. He was dismissive and thought that I was pulling a joke on him. And when he realized I wasn't, he thought that I was crazy or seeing things. There are many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week three. I absolutely refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have had to leave my boyfriend's house a little early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days that we went to a park to walk around, he decided that on the way back, he wanted to drive by that house where I'd seen the thing. I was hysterical, begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded. So as we got closer, and I realized I couldn't stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night. At one point he stopped the car and said, you have to see this. I said, no and resisted him pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this, look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted, no, no, let's get out of here. I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, he said. No furniture, no power wiring, no interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnt houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered, as they didn't know about a fire there 
and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. Talking about it still makes my chest tighten. It makes my skin crawl and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it. A thing that's nothing like any creature known to humans. But I saw it. But still, the other part of me says it can't exist. If you've heard of something that matches this description, let me know. I'd love to find some answers. This all happened near Moulton, Alabama. So if you live in the area and do you know what this thing might be, I'd love to hear about it. Growing up, I was fortunate enough to live right at the edge of a very large nature preserve. The area was not open to the public, but thanks to the location of my neighborhood, there were several lesser known entrances that I could use to gain access and explore to my heart's content. Countless days of my childhood were spent hiking, swimming, and playing pretend with my best friend in these woods. The woods became like a second home to me. I felt like I knew every shortcut and secret cave and I always felt at peace, except for one very unusual instance, which is the subject of this story. My best friend and neighbor, who I'll refer to as Jacob, knew these woods just as well as I did. We had several choice spots that we liked hiking to, and a couple of makeshift forts that we made out of sticks and such. Keep in mind that things were simpler back then and our parents felt little need to worry about us. They were accustomed to us disappearing for hours on end while we explored the woods. This was also before cell phones were a thing. One more important thing to note is that these woods were once home to Native Americans, more specifically the Comanche tribe. Oftentimes, we would find arrowheads left behind by the Native tribes, or ancient cans and bits of supplies, presumably left by the settlers who eventually found the area and took it for themselves. We found this bit of history fascinating, and going in the woods sometimes felt like taking a step away from the modern world and going back to a different time. One afternoon, Jacob and I packed up some water and snacks and set out into the woods like we had many times before. Usually, we would stick to the trails or the creek so that we would be able to find our way back home easily. But today, we had an urge to explore even deeper than we had gone before. We headed off the trail and into the uncharted areas of the preserve that even our parents hadn't taken us to before. Things were fine at first, but soon, we realized that the trees had gotten incredibly dense. It became increasingly difficult to walk, as dead tree branches seemed to reach and claw at us every step of the way. We both found ourselves a sturdy stick and used this as a makeshift machete, chopping and carving ourselves a path through the trees. There was no longer any trail to be found, but we didn't care. We were invincible kids who knew these woods well. What was the worst that could happen? We had been proceeding like this for probably about 15 to 20 minutes when we got a horrible feeling. That horrible feeling that we were being watched. Jacob and I looked at each other at practically the same moment and he said, Dude, do you feel that? Yeah, I said. I feel it. We both agreed that something felt very wrong. We couldn't describe why, but we both had the same feeling of dread that someone or something was watching us. We quickly agreed that it was time to head back. We turned around and started making our way back, 
But after several minutes, we started having doubts that we knew where we were. The woods were dense here, denser than any part of the preserve we had seen, and it was nearly impossible to move. We were getting tired from hacking away tree branches and decided to stop for a break and try to get our bearings. That's when we noticed something else that was wrong. It was completely silent, save for our labored breathing. These woods, normally teeming with life, were absolutely still. To this day, I haven't experienced anything like it. We couldn't hear a single bug or a bird or even the rushing water of the creek. It was suddenly dead. These comfortable woods that were so familiar to us suddenly felt alien and hostile. And we still had that feeling of being watched, although stalked might be a better word for it. Jacob and I were absolutely done with the adventure by this point. We were completely turned around and we couldn't even tell if we were heading back the way we'd come at this point. He tried to climb a tree to see where we were, but it was too difficult. He would have to break dozens of branches just to get a couple of feet off the ground. And these trees were tall. The branches were so thick that they blocked out the sun at times. When climbing the tree failed, we both started yelling in hopes that someone might hear us. But the only reply we received was the oppressive silence of the woods. It was at this moment of desperation that we spotted something through the trees, probably about 20 or so yards away. Out of the corner of our eyes, we clearly saw an adult-sized figure, which quickly moved behind a tree once we spotted it. Jacob and I traded one brief and panicked look at each other and bolted in the opposite direction of the figure. We sprinted like human wrecking balls through the branches, no longer taking care to carve ourselves a nice safe path. Branches clawed and scraped at our legs, arms, and faces as our flight instinct kicked into overdrive. My lungs burned, but I didn't care. At one point, Jacob, who was wearing our backpack full of water and snacks, got snagged on a particularly large branch. I stopped to help untangle him as fast as I could, and we kept sprinting, not daring to look back behind us. A few times, I thought I heard something breaking branches as it followed us, but I can't be certain. We continued running for what felt like ages. In reality, we ran for what was probably 15 to 20 minutes. When we finally broke through the tree line and into a clearing, I was so relieved I could have cried. I wish that the story ended here so that I could chalk it up to the overactive imagination of two stupid lost kids, but I can't. Because it turns out this clearing was essentially the backyard of a very large and very old two-story house. A house that we didn't know existed until that moment. Decades old blue paint peeled off the exterior. The roof was missing several shingles, many of which were lying in the overgrown grass below. The house had several large windows that were caked with grime. A single dirt road made its way from the front of the house and up a small hill, and we couldn't see where it led. It was obvious that this house wasn't part of our neighborhood, or any neighborhood that we had been to before, for that matter. Jacob and I were halfway terrified and halfway in awe at our discovery. This house felt like our own personal discovery after a perilous quest. A bit of our fear from the woods evaporated as we summoned the courage to investigate. We walked up to the side of the house that was on our left and peered through the dirty window into the strange home. The first floor seemed to consist of mainly one large room. Along the wall opposite us 
was a wooden staircase leading to the second floor. The first floor was completely devoid of any furniture. No tables, no chairs, no couches or anything. Just dozens upon dozens of broken bottles. Shards of glass covered almost the entirety of the first floor, as well as a few yellowed books and magazines that were sprawled open, some with pages clearly ripped out and laying next to them. In the center of the room was a single sleeping bag, filthy from what we could see, with an unlit candlestick standing next to it. What are y'all doing? I nearly shat myself in horror. We immediately pulled away from the window and saw that a man had walked around from the right side of the building and was now standing about 15 feet away from us. He was wearing nothing except for some dirty denim overalls. He had scarred skin that looked like rough leather. And his eyes, well, neither of his eyes were looking in the same direction, and neither one was looking directly at us. Everything about this man looked wrong, and not just because of his physical appearance. You know how some people, you can just feel their energy? It's hard to describe, but this guy just felt so wrong in every way. We were frozen in place, surprised and terrified by his appearance there. We stared at him for a moment until Jacob found words to speak. We're, uh, 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 just checking out the house, he said sheepishly. The stranger seemed to take a moment to digest his response before gesturing to the woods and saying, you should head back the way you came. You never know. And he just let that last sentence hang in the air. You never know. Jacob, God bless him, quickly thought of something to say while I still stared in absolute terror. Well, actually, we need to head to the road. Our parents will be expecting us soon. The man did not reply. He just stood there with his mouth slightly open, his eyes dancing off in different directions. It seemed like he was thinking hard about something. We didn't waste another second getting out of there. We walked as quickly as we could toward the front of the house and made our way up the dirt driveway, for lack of a better term, trying not to appear panicked. I say driveway because there were no cars at the house, not even a garage. The front of the house consisted of a porch, which was also littered with old cans, broken bottles, and yellowed pages from old magazines. We felt the man's gaze boring into our backs as we trudged up the driveway. It was rather long, and once we rounded the first corner and were out of sight of the house, we started running again. Eventually, we reached a paved road. There was no mailbox or address that we could see. We followed this paved road for quite some time. It felt like ages before we could begin to recognize where we were again. It turns out that we had gone through the entire nature preserve and were on the complete opposite side from where our neighborhood was. It took the rest of the afternoon to walk back home, but we made it safe and sound without incident. We didn't tell our parents what had happened because we were afraid that they would restrict our freedom and not let us go into the woods again. And we didn't go into the woods again for a few weeks. When we did go back, we rarely left the trails, and we never went into that area again. To this day, Jacob is convinced that something paranormal is going on there, that we found ourselves in the midst of things both unfathomable and dangerous. We're both usually pretty realistic and grounded people, but I'm inclined to agree with him. I'm still not sure if the feelings of dread or spookiness in the woods and the house and the man are related in any way. I doubt I'll ever know. After retiring from the service in 2009, I was in Iraq working as a contractor. 
My job entailed traveling all over the country, making sure specific things got done. Sounds like a lot, but it really wasn't. In the end of August of that year, I was detailed up to Mosul. I traveled, worked out the issues, and on the way back, I was directed to go through Balad to hitch a ride to Baghdad. While waiting for the ride in the air terminal, there was a battalion of army support folks who were also traveling. Many of them were sick, coughing and hacking up a lung. I tried to stay as far away from them as I could. My travel continued without them, but I was to live to regret it. A week later, I came down with swine flu, thanks to all that coughing and hacking. I went to the doctor on post, and because I was retired military, I was seen. He said that I was to immediately go into quarantine. My barracks did not have individual bathrooms, so I was led to the truck by my buddy and driven the five miles to the other side of the base complex to Camp Liberty. I was sent down the road past the PX, on down to the right-hand side past the Y, if you have been there, you will understand, and almost to the end of the road, two large campsites short, down by the rec yard, where they brought all the destroyed vehicles. Then, way back, to almost the eastern outside wall of the camp, I was one camp short of the wall. The camps were about 20 trailers long, all surrounded by concrete T-walls. You could drive between the rows. Then, ten of those rows wide made up a camp, with a large space to drive semi-trucks between each camp. My hut was the one on the end. It connected to another living space through a shared bathroom. My buddy kicked me out of the truck and I walked between the T-walls up to the door and opened it. The dust on the floor didn't bother me at first. Everything is dusty in Iraq. My buddy followed me in and we looked at the dusty, dusty accommodations. I walked over and flipped the mattress over to a clean side and sat down. The room had a desk, a walk-in closet, and the shared bathroom. It also had an air conditioner that, when turned on, pumped out very cool, sweet-smelling air. It was then when I noticed the calendar hanging on the wall, July 2007, two years before. My buddy told me that he would go and pick up my poncho liner and laptop that was in my day pack so that I could watch movies while I waited out my seven days of quarantine. He also told me that he would bring me meals during the days that I was staying there. I thanked him, and he left. It was mid-afternoon, and I was tired, so I laid down and tried to breathe while resting, feeling sick as a dog. It was then in the quiet that I thought I heard someone talking outside. I couldn't catch the conversation, which bothered me some, as I couldn't hear if they were speaking English or Farsi. The hut door was locked, and I went on through the bathroom to see if the other hut door was locked, which it was. I kept the lights off so that nobody would know that I was there and come looking. When my buddy came back, I told him what had happened. It was getting dark by then. He had brought my laptop, poncho liner, and as an afterthought, he included a nice tanto knife I traveled with as I was not supposed to have a firearm for some reason. He left and I curled up in my poncho liner, and soon I was fast asleep. I woke later that night sleeping on my side facing the wall. It had grown quite dark in the room. Still facing the wall, I could hear voices speaking quite softly, but this time distinctly. You ask him. No, you ask him. At this point, I was wide awake and staring at the wall. Did I forget to lock the door? Who was in here with me? Something kicked the bed frame, and I thought somebody was trying to figure out why I was sleeping in their room. So I rolled over and looked around, but no one was there. I got up and checked the doors and under the bed. You could say that I was somewhat shaken by the encounter thus far. After everything was checked, including the closet, I turned on the closet light, but I left it cracked open a bit. So I was in the shadows in the room, and the room was light so I could see the rest of it. If somebody was messing with me, I was not going to take it. I was sick and feeling pretty crappy and just over it. This time I wrapped up in the poncho liner facing the room. 
Things got quiet after a while, so I drifted off to sleep. I was awakened again about an hour later by these same voices, asking the same thing. Only, this time, a voice stated clearly, I'll ask him. It was at this time that I was laying on my back, and something climbed up onto my bed and sat on my feet like you would do during the sit-up event for PT. Needless to say, I was wide awake, and they had my full attention. With a sharp intake of breath, what or whoever was sitting on my feet jumped off. I sat up, and there was nobody in the room that I could see. The smell in the room, which was cool and dusty, turned into a sharp, burned smell. I thought it was coming from the air conditioner, so I got up to check. When my back was turned, I heard the voice say distinctly, Ask him. I told them in my best SGM voice to stand easy and I would be with them in a minute. I walked to the door and went outside, leaving the door open. It was early morning and around 4 a.m. The sun was just starting to light up the sky. I sat down on the steps and waited for my buddy. At 6 o'clock a.m. he showed up and looked at me strangely, asking why I was out on the steps as he handed my breakfast to me. I told him we were leaving. He laughed and said, no, you have six more days of quarantine. Go back inside and relax. I looked at him and said, no, I'm good. He found me sitting in the shade of the tea wall for lunch, same for dinner. He was starting to wonder what was going on. I told him, I'll tell you if you take me away from here. He just laughed as he drove away. The same thing happened to me that night, and more. The next day, I was sitting on the steps when four soldiers carried a private by the legs and arms into the room next to me and flung him on the bed. They dropped a box of MREs and a 12-pack of water and laughing said, Later, loser. I stayed outside till around 2300 hours, and then I went in and prepped for the nightly activities. The following morning at about 5 a.m., I was sitting out on the steps when the door to the other hut burst open and a very scared private ran out. He looked left, then right, breathing pretty hard like he had just run a marathon. I smiled at him and said, how's it going? He sat down and tried to light a cigarette, but his hands were shaking so badly he couldn't light the match and gave up after a few seconds. I could tell he was pretty shaken up by something. He looked right at me and said, D did you? I said, you met them too, I see. And he calmed down a little. I said, I don't think they're going to do any harm to you, but it is a little unsettling. He said, yeah, I'm leaving. They can't make me stay here. I laughed and said that I had four more days and could use the company. His mind was made up and when it got light, he went and packed up all his stuff and left. My buddy was true to his word, and each day he brought me breakfast, lunch, and dinner like clockwork, each time finding me sitting on the steps or in the shade with the door open, waiting. Finally, on the last day, he came by for lunch and said, time to leave so we can go get pizza. I had all my stuff packed and shut the door and jumped in the truck. He asked, now are you going to tell me what's going on? I told him, not until we are far away from this place. We drove over to the belaying office to give the key back. We went inside and had to wait as a tall, muscular Army CW4 was chewing out one of his soldiers. He was not in a good mood. When he was done, I walked up and introduced myself as the guy staying in the quarantine hut. He asked if there were any problems as he reached out for the key. I looked him in the eye and as he grabbed the key, I hung on and said, Chief, you need to cut that key and the key to the other side of that hut in half and never issue it to anyone again. He was not amused, asking if anything was wrong with the hut. I said, you just go and spend one night there and you'll understand why I'm telling you to cut those keys up. He got pissed and took the keys. I left with my buddy looking at me like I'd lost my mind. At pizza an hour later, I told my buddy what had happened that whole week, leaving nothing out. He thought I was full of crap. 
A week later, I was walking through the PX at Camp Liberty, looking at all the pod over items, thinking if I could use another t-shirt with a slogan on it, or a new 501 shirt with my buddy in tow, when down the aisle, I see the chief running at me. He grabs my arm and says, I cut the keys in half. I cut them in half, and no one under any circumstance will stay in those huts ever again. This shocked and surprised my buddy. The chief said he was pissed at me when I turned in the key, thinking I had trashed the place. We went over to check it out. It was getting dusk when he left. He found the rooms neat and tidy, but also found them, and they wanted to talk with him. I later learned that the camp was handed over to the Iraqi army. I always wondered who got those rooms, and just how that went for them. In summary, I think it was a unique experience. I think that there were approximately seven to ten distinct individual entities present at any given time during my stay. They never followed me outside or into the bathroom, which was nice of them. They did go from room to room where people were staying, making themselves known. It was usually in the late evening to early morning, usually gone before the sun was up. I felt that I couldn't really help them, but... I did tell them that they were quite possibly dead and that they needed to move on. I didn't get any names from any of them. It just seemed that it wasn't important to them to tell me. It was more of a, can you see me and do I exist type of experience. I've thought on this many times and I've told a few people. Most think it was made up because I was sick. I don't think so. Usually when I'm sick, I dream about fly fishing in cool mountain streams not ghosts chatting with me. The private and the chief were also involved, and I didn't know either of them before I was sent to quarantine. And when the chief was in there, he wasn't even sick. So, who knows? I live in Oregon, specifically Yamhill County, a moderately sized, mostly rural county. I'm half Native American, half Caucasian, with my tribe being an Algonquin-speaking people of the Anishinaabe. Unfortunately, as I live in Oregon, and the tribe is located around Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Canada, and there's a pandemic going on right now, I haven't been able to visit my specific tribe as of yet. I am over 18, although I don't want to disclose my age for obvious reasons. I live with my mom, who is where I get my Caucasian from, and my sister. My dad passed away about two and a half years ago. We have three dogs of varying sizes and four outdoor cats. In the part of Oregon I live in, you're never more than 10 minutes away from a forest 20 minutes from a mountain top, and even in the cities there's plenty of forestry. I live just outside of one of these towns, only a short, several minute drive, but far enough to where light pollution doesn't heavily affect me, and I can see the stars rather clearly. I've lived at this house since I was a kid, and although I've always gotten the creeps about this place, since it's next to a giant forest, it's been a while since anything that I could categorize as paranormal has happened to me. I'm pretty skeptical and not so superstitious. I think science can probably explain about 95% of the world's mysteries, although I've seen some stuff that I have no rational explanation for, and the things that have happened to me over the past three days fall solidly into that category. I know a decent bit about skinwalkers. They come from the Ute and Navajo tribe legends, being witches that are the antithesis to medicine men, commonly found around the Four Corners areas of the United States, on and around Navajo reservations. But my knowledge is limited to different internet retellings of legends, so I only know a few baseline rules. Don't fall for their imitation voices. If you smell dead, rotting meat, you need to get out of there immediately. Don't acknowledge its presence directly, don't say its name out loud unless you want to attract one, and if you want to harm one, you'll need white ashes, like that from burnt wood or burnt sage. If you suspect one being near you or hunting you, 
and if you happen to spot its true human identity, then you can say its name and accuse it of being a skinwalker to kill it. How much of all that is true I'm still unsure of for a number of reasons, the largest being that I don't think any of the videos that I have watched were made by natives who would have more intimate knowledge of these creatures, but I could be talking out of my ass on that end for all I know. Some background for this property. According to the previous owners, who are part of a family who have lived here for generations, there was once a log cabin built here on top of a native burial ground, which is also on a long, inactive volcano. Sounds cliché, I know, but it's absolutely true, near as I can tell from the burial ground part, and the inactive volcano part is completely true. There have been a number of odd, unexplainable phenomenon, which I'll keep short. The most notable include 12-foot metal doors belonging to a car painting booth, being shook intensely by absolutely nothing, an old 50s metal gas or oil can flying up from behind a ton of junk and flying directly at one of my dad's friends, a running sound followed up by the mirror door in my parents' bedroom being shattered at 3 a.m. one night, the exact same time that my dad's best man died. Needless to say that while I haven't encountered any Bigfoot or Mothmen, I have seen some stranger things that I have no logical explanation for. The property I live on is around 10 acres in size. The house is decently large, with a one-car garage and office, which is where my sister is currently chilling out at. The office is next to the garage. There's a large metal garage about 200 yards east from the house. The smaller garage and the house have motion lights all around their perimeter for proper illumination, in case anything or anyone gets near the home. But the larger garage only has a halogen bulb outside its main door, and that went out last week. Now at night, that entire area of the property is pitch black. The house has three doors, two on a porch to the front yard and driveway, one to the laundry room and into the backyard. On the eastmost side is the living room, with nine windows and one of the doors, a kitchen area with a view onto the porch, another living room type area, and then a hallway to the bathrooms and bedrooms. The office in the smaller garage has two entrances, one heading directly to the backyard, which is sliding glass, and two partially iron, partially glass doors that head into the garage itself. The metal garage was built over the aforementioned cabin and has an attic that spans its entire length. It has a car lift, a paint booth that can fit a limousine, a bathroom, and a scaffolding with a heater, which is where the gas can flew from. Around 15 feet behind the shop is a large forest that I have never stepped into due to there being a crazy old man living in it. While I haven't stepped into it, my sister and her friends have headed in a few times, each time returning with odd objects. Though they haven't gone into the forest for several years, I remember them bringing out stuff like statues, animal bones, and weird rocks. Aside from these, the only things we see out here animal-wise are does and baby deer just passing on through our yard to get to the forest. Now for the current events. At around 4 a.m. on Saturday night, I was preparing to go to bed in my family living room. My room is painted black, and being the summer here, it gets ridiculously hot during the day, and I don't have good AC at the moment, so I'm sleeping out in the living room. As I was about to sleep, I heard the cats fighting, something that's not too odd. They're mostly males and get pretty riled up. But then I heard something else. Three distinct knocks on one of my front doors. This immediately freaked me out for a few reasons. For one, it was 4 a.m. and pitch black outside, and these were knocks that were far too loud for any animal to make, and sounded far too high for it to be an animal too. Second, my motion tracker lights were still off. After the knocking, my dogs headed toward the other front door. This one is partially iron, partially glass, like those in the office. And that's when they lost their minds barking, something they only ever do when they see something they don't recognize. I locked all my windows, closed all the blinds, and just sat on the couch bed, 
In my living room, facing out toward the front yard, there's a half circle shaped window with no blinds that allows me to see when the motion trackers turn on or off. I sat, staring at this window for about an hour and a half until they finally came on and the sun came up. I didn't have the courage to go look as to what caused the lights to trigger. From the stories I've heard of skinwalkers, I wasn't taking a single risk. The next morning I asked my mom if she had heard the knocking on the door to get a disturbing answer from her and my sister. My mom had also heard the knocking, but also heard it on her windows to the bedroom. And my sister heard the knocking on the sliding glass door to the office. I knew then that this was something that had knocked multiple times, as there's no way I could have mistaken the tapping on my door for something tapping on my sister's door. While the sun was up, my sister and I bought some sage, since, from what I know of it, it wards off skinwalkers, but my mom misplaced it before we could burn it. By the time we realized we couldn't find it, the shop that we went to had closed, so we just had to hope that nothing worse would come that night. The second night was much more disturbing than the first. While I didn't spot anything, I heard a loud ambient noise from the woods. The nearest broad comparison I could make is like how a city sounds in the dead of night when there's construction. But this sounded more organic and natural in origin in some strange way. Another much more niche comparison would be the song Cave of the Past from Earthbound as it's the only song I can think of that fit the ambiance. I heard this ambient noise for around half an hour while I walked my dogs in the front yard, and while I wanted to just stay inside and drown out my paranoia with some anime, my mom made me take the dogs out, claiming there's nothing out there that can harm you, in spite of the fact that she had heard the knocking the night before too. As I was walking the last dog, I heard something from the forest to the east chanting. I only heard about one short sentence in some dialect that I couldn't discern, but that was all I needed to hear in order to head inside and lock everything up again. From there, I could hear the ambience even inside my house, and I was up again until the sun crested over the hills. One more thing about this night, though. There was a light that refused to go out. It was one of the motion trackers on the one-car garage, and each time I would look out at it, I would see nothing, but yet it stayed on through the entire night. In order for it to do that, something would have had to have been pacing in front of it. Finally, tonight, I woke up late, as staying up until sunrise tends to make you do, so I forgot to get sage before I headed to work. Once I came home from work, it was already dark out, as I get off by the time the sun is setting. Around 2 a.m., I was taking out my dogs for the last time. Tonight, there wasn't any ambient noise or chanting, and I stayed strictly to the small plot of yard directly in front of my house. But as I was once again taking out the last dog, I heard a noise to the east, and this scared the crap out of me. It sounded like something large had been knocked over or thrown down, something that was loud enough for me to hear hundreds of yards away. Immediately, I turned toward the noise and tugged on my dog's leash to drag them inside, keeping my back to the illuminated sections of my yard while I went inside. I've locked my doors, my car, and everything else that I can, and I've tried ignoring everything, but I feel that I need help. These events are slowly escalating, and I only fear that tomorrow could bring a full-on encounter. I've been unable to sleep again thanks to this, and the fact that it's happened three nights in a row is a little disturbing. Now, while I think it could be a skinwalker, I also think it could be a wendigo. They're similar, and wendigos come from Algonquin-speaking tribes, which my tribe is a part of. If it was the latter, though, I have a hunch it would have made itself more known already. Whereas with a skinwalker, I think it could be trying to lure me out into the darkness of the shop. I've been trying to get a hold of a medicine man here in Oregon, but all I can find on Google is old articles. It's almost like it refuses to let me find the help that I need so desperately.
If anybody knows where I can find one to come and bless the house and the property, I would be elated to get this over with. These past few nights alone have been hellish, and I would rather not have to see for myself the horrors that I've heard described many times. Tonight when I came home from work, I heard a hissing and growling from the woods behind the garage, and later as I was taking my dogs out, I spotted eyes about seven or eight feet up, directly in front of the big metal garage. At this rate, I fear that when I come home tomorrow, or Thursday, or the next day, it'll just wait out on the road for me. I really, really need help. I went to Sydney, Australia and tried the ghost tour at Q Station. Weird things happened there. Despite having a comfortable flight from Manila to Sydney, I still felt tired. After passing through immigration, I immediately went to the arrival hall, loaded my Opal card, and rode a train to my mate's flat in Burwood. It was raining when I arrived in Sydney. At only 18 degrees, the warm shower and the bed were the only two things that I looked forward to. It was still raining when I woke up. The overcast weather made the day bleak and gloomy. Then, I just remembered the things I watched online a few days ago, and one of them was the ghost tours in Sydney. I asked my mate about it, and the next thing I knew, he already booked us an extreme ghost tour on a weekend after my trip to Melbourne. Sydney was not a glamorous city back in the 19th century. Diseases such as smallpox, Spanish influenza, and bubonic plague were prevalent. To mitigate the spread of these infectious diseases, all ships entering Sydney Harbor must be checked by the doctors. Even if there was only one sick passenger on board, everybody was required to stay at the quarantine station for 40 days. Those who were sick were brought to the hospital for treatment. At least 16,000 people were brought here from the 1830s to 1984. 570 people died here. Today, Q Station serves as a hotel, a conference center, and a part of Sydney Harbor National Park. Our extreme ghost tour was scheduled at around 9 p.m. To beat the weekend traffic of North Sydney, we left Burwood at around 6 p.m. and drove all the way to Manly. We had our dinner there before heading to Q Station, located east of Manly Beach. We arrived at half past eight, way too early for the tour. So we went straight to the front desk and toured around. Some of the original relics like tombstones, luggage, and clothing are still there. It felt eerie upon seeing those personal belongings that once belonged to people who got quarantined here more than a hundred years ago. Disclaimer. We met up with the group at half past nine. Our guide, Bob, told us that we should not rationalize everything we would encounter during the tour. Jace and I are both air traffic controllers, and in our line of work, we rationalize everything. This time, we would have to leave everything behind and open up our senses. We were given EMF, or electromagnetic field sensors. This instrument detects an anomaly of the surrounding electromagnetic field. Experts believe that ghosts manifest themselves as a form of energy. First stop, the chamber. The tour started inside the chamber. There are two rooms. Both aren't that big with a floor area approximately 50 square meters. We were locked inside for at least five minutes, just to observe everything. I didn't feel anything in the first room, except that it faintly smelled of hay. I didn't mind it because I thought it used to be a barn. But in the second room, I felt something. The surrounding air felt heavy, and I felt an unknown force pressing on my cheeks. It was quite difficult to breathe at some points. As we went out, Bob told us that it used to be a gas chamber. 
About 40 people were locked inside for sanitary reasons. Now, it all made sense as to why it felt so heavy inside, and why I felt claustrophobic inside the second room. The second stop was the hospital. It was quite a long hike to the quarantine hospital. During the early days, it was harder to get to the hospital. You would need to climb the steep walkways. Basically, when you're on top, you're completely isolated. The hospital is located near the cliff overlooking Sydney Harbor. There are several buildings around, including the quarters of the nurses and doctors. Hospitals, no matter how modern their facilities are, can get creepy at night. But this one was way creepier than I thought. We first entered the doctor's quarters. It was dark, but cold inside the room, and there were three bunk beds inside. As I sat and leaned on the lower bunk bed while listening to Bob's stories, I felt something was pinching my lower back. I shrieked, and Bob caught my attention. I told Bob that it was nothing. I lied. We went into the main hospital room. It was quite big, and there were six beds. Feeling brave, I lied down on one bed and tried to make some connections. I don't know how, but I just closed my eyes momentarily. I felt nothing, and honestly, the bed felt soft and comfortable. I transferred to an adjacent bed near the wall, and the moment that I lied down, it felt weird. It felt like something was pushing me, but not in a forcible manner. The room is connected to another room that had a darker history. Bob told us to open the door and asked if we felt something different. Everyone told him that it was colder in that room, despite the doors and windows being tightly shut. Some of our EMF detectors went crazy. According to Bob, there are four resident ghosts inside this room. Two children who love to play hide-and-seek inside the cupboard. A woman, and the malevolent spirit of an old man. There were stories circulating around that one group who stayed overnight in the hospital decided to record themselves singing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and they caught something on the recording. They heard children giggling, a woman saying, wait, wait, and an angry voice of a male shouting, get out. Jace had his EMF detector pointed near the cupboard. It went crazy. So what he did, he got his phone and started recording himself singing the same song. Actually, we were all at the center of the room, and we didn't hear him singing. After we went out, we played back his recording. Believe it or not, he caught something on his recording. There weren't disembodied voices from children or from the women, but in the middle of his singing, someone was shouting in the background, F you, your singing stinks. Things got real. The third stop is the Gravedigger's House. The Gravedigger's House is one of the most haunted parts of the complex. It's so haunted that Bob won't dig deeper into its bloody history. It used to be the house of, of course, the Gravedigger and a doctor. Just a few steps from the house is the third class cabin. During that time, there were reports of missing girls and children. Eyewitness reports claimed that they saw some kids and girls entering the grave digger's house. More so, the doctor was attached to the girls, especially the young ones. The house is a bungalow. It has two bedrooms with a small living room, dining room, and the kitchen and the bathroom are located at the back part. Bob left us in the house for at least ten minutes. The first room to the right used to be the bedroom of the doctor. As I slowly entered the room, the atmosphere drastically changed. It felt cold and sad at the same time. I don't know, I just couldn't help but be sad in that room. I went out right away because I couldn't take the sadness any longer. The second room was rather weird. I was about to enter there, but something felt wrong. It felt like there was a force barring me from entering. Some of my group mates checked their EMF and it went a bit crazy. I guess everybody was not welcome to come inside. 
The back portion, where the kitchen and the bathroom are located, was the scariest part of the house. It was dark, but that part of the house was faintly illuminated by the moon outside. I stayed there for at least three minutes, just to observe. I suddenly felt goosebumps all over my body. As I neared the bathroom, it felt sinister. I didn't go inside because my instincts told me not to. I managed to take photos inside the house. My phone didn't catch anything paranormal, but all the photos are super creepy. When everybody is outside, Bob confessed that the bathroom was the most haunted part of the house. Locals claimed that a girl was brutally murdered inside the bathroom, and that she got strangled by barbed wire. Fourth stop was the morgue. Firstly, I never like going to a morgue, especially if it's dark and abandoned. I was very nervous the moment that we entered the morgue. To add to the scare factor, they had a mannequin lying at the center, covered with a white cloth. I know it's staged, but it still creeps the hell out of me. While Bob was talking about history, it started to get cold, but weirdly only on my right side. No one was standing to my right. There was nothing there but a door that led to the laboratory. A cold breeze passed through the door. I wasn't paying attention to Bob's story, because I felt like somebody was standing beside me. I whispered to Jace about it, so he scanned his EMF, and suddenly there was a spike of energy. He told me to calm down, but I was so close to breaking down. As minutes went by, I started to feel goosebumps on my right arm, and I could feel that somebody was actually touching my arm. It was like a gentle caress, but definitely not human. I became uneasy after we went out of the morgue, and Bob noticed. He smiled and said, The resident ghost liked you, didn't he? Really, Bob? The fifth stop was the shower block. The shower block is the most haunted place in the whole queue station. During that time, those who were sick had to take a shower of carbonic acid, not water, at the shower block. The acid killed fleas and ticks in seconds. Two days after, your skin starts to peel off. It was dark and eerie as we entered the shower block. The stench was still there, and I felt lightheaded. The same feeling when you just got out of a boat ride. Bob told us that there are shadows lurking around the dark corners of the shower block. For 15 minutes, we were instructed to roam around and observe. He told us to go to the corner where we felt the most uncomfortable. I had goosebumps as we passed by the center aisle and turned right, since we both felt uneasy on this side. As we were walking back to the center aisle, I felt that somebody was watching us from behind. So instinctively, we turned our heads slowly, and there we saw a dark figure peering from the corner of the block. I am pretty much sure that my mind was not playing tricks on me. The figure was tall, about seven feet, and it was darker than the dark. All of a sudden, it came right after us. I don't know what happened next, but Jace and I were back at the main door of the block in a jiffy. Whatever that thing was, it scared the crap out of me. The tour lasted for three hours. It was already 12.30 a.m. when we went back to the parking lot, safe and sound. I honestly don't know what to feel after the tour. I was physically and mentally exhausted. Nonetheless, it was a great experience. It finally validated that I am sensitive to the paranormal. I do believe in ghosts, and I don't easily get scared by them. But my experience at Q Station was overwhelming. A lot can happen in three hours. I grew up in a household that rarely attended church. Sometimes, when visiting our grandparents, my two brothers and I would be forced to go to worship services, but those moments were few and far between. Even so, it's almost impossible to avoid running across Christian symbols in books, movies, and television shows. 
Thus, it's likely most Americans have at least a basic understanding of such Christian symbols as the cross and angelic beings. So when my youngest brother Parker, of around three years old, began telling us that he saw angels, my parents saw no immediate cause for concern, nor were they at all surprised. From what I can remember, all of the adults in the family and in our friend circles thought it was cute. I must admit, I was a bit more skeptical than the grown-ups. Quite frankly, I could not shake an unsettling feeling deep in my gut that something about it just wasn't right. Some time later, my brothers and I were spending a summer day at our babysitter's mind-numbingly boring home when my youngest brother called out for someone to come and look at a picture he had just finished. Now, being all of three years old, abstract shapes and outrageous color schemes constituted the bulk of my brother's artwork up until this point. At least, this is the level of work we were all used to and fully expected to see. As it happens, I was the first to arrive on the scene and lay eyes on the drawing. The first thing I noticed, to my astonishment, was the lack of color. In fact, the entire drawing consisted of various shades of black, which was completely out of character in my brother's case. Before I was even aware of what I had laid my eyes upon, a cold chill was creeping up my spine, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand on end. The next thing I could not avoid being struck by was the seemingly miraculous leap forward in this three-year-old boy's artistic ability. I could actually make out the discernible details of a figure, demonstrating ability well beyond his years. Without regard to the figure on the page, I immediately felt something scandalous must be afoot. I marched over to our middle brother, Christian, fully intent upon drawing a confession out of him. He must have sketched the figure and conspired to have a little fun at my expense. I was not laughing. I couldn't shake this feeling of being disturbed, much like the one I would get from creepy pictures or statues that seemed to stare directly into my soul. When he pled his innocence, I quickly dragged Christian over to the table and demanded that he end his charade. However, the moment his eyes met the figure, I recognized the look on his face. I imagined it must have been exactly as I had looked upon viewing the figure only moments before. Tears began to stream from his eyes as I released his arm and watched him race over to the secure arms of his favorite teddy bear. He always had that bear with him, but I had not seen him act as he did in that moment in years. He was three all over again. I was beginning to feel sweat beating up on my forehead and the back of my neck. I turned to Parker, who had not moved from his spot at the table throughout the entirety of the commotion, his face displaying a confused look. As the oldest, not wanting to leave the responsibility to our babysitter, I decided that I would inquire about the figure. The figure? Up to this point, I hadn't even considered what exactly my brother had drawn. All I knew was that it was chilling me to the bone and I couldn't understand why, but I would soon have my answer. Before launching into my interrogation, I glanced back at the shadowy figure on the paper. Why had I not spent a moment to figure out what he had drawn? Was it my subconscious attempting to protect me from identifying it? These questions ran through my brain, and still do every time I lie awake in bed at night, some twenty plus years later, wary of what may be waiting for me in the darkest corners of my room, behind the door and under the bed. Some things just stick with you, and tend to rear their ugly head at the worst moments. What I saw on the paper haunts me to this day. The drawing was of a dark, shadowy figure, partly veiled in what appeared to be smoke or possibly mist. The body was nude, and the limbs and torso were contorted in grotesquely unnatural fashions. Tears were welling up in my eyes as I scanned the figure, slowly drifting up toward its face. This face was something indescribably sinister and horrid. It had no business even being a figment of imagination, much less being sketched by a three-year-old. I cannot, after all of these years, find something even remotely like it to compare it with. It didn't exactly have eyes, but you felt like it was staring right through you, like it knew you. I felt like it knew more about me than I knew myself. 
Yet there was something oddly familiar about the figure. What I suppose could possibly pass for a mouth stretched from the middle of its lopsided egg-shaped head all the way to the very bottom of its face. Impossible as it may seem, the figure appeared to be smiling and whispering at the same time. For some reason, I felt like it was asking me to remember. Remember what? Looking up at my three-year-old brother with his blue eyes and innocent expression, I could not believe such a vision of utter darkness and cruelty could spring forth from his young and inexperienced mind. Was this something he thought about often? Had he dreamt it and felt compelled to put it down on paper? If he was at all frightened by the image, as Christian and I clearly were, he wasn't showing the slightest sign. I could only bring myself to ask him a single question. Why? Just then, Christian accidentally knocked the television remote to the floor, momentarily snapping me out of the dramatic heaviness of the moment. He still looked mortified. I turned to the three-year-old behind me, realizing there might just be some mystery about to be revealed, and heard the words I immediately realized were the cause of my unease with the figure. When I asked him why, he simply smiled and said, I see him every day. He's my angel. Upon hearing this, something seemed to break inside me. It was as if some switch flipped and an impossibly dim light flickered to life in a dark and distant room. A faded memory from as far back as I can remember began to take shape. On the couch behind me, Christian began sobbing loudly. He was definitely his three-year-old self, squeezing his teddy bear and moaning that he wanted our mother. Something from within compelled me to go over to him. It was not a voice, but it was definitely a feeling. I was out of my element. We needed mom and dad. The babysitter was not going to be enough. Something was seriously wrong, and we did not have any answers. The moment I sank into the couch, my brother threw his teddy bear and wrapped his arms around me. This was certainly new. We loved each other, about as much as two young brothers can hope to love one another, but the only times we ever hugged were for family pictures. And yet I could tell that it was the most appropriate thing the two of us could do in that moment. He needed it. I needed it. Without looking up at me, through alternating sobs and snivels, he began to speak. He told me he wished he had never looked at the figure. He asked me why I had made him do it, which drove a hot dagger right through my little heart. I began to cry once again, telling him that I was sorry in my own whimpering voice. After we sat there crying for what seemed like an hour, though it was likely mere minutes, my brother once again spoke. This time he seemed oddly calm, almost as if he had not been crying and shaking with fear for the past several minutes. While he spoke, my attention was fading in and out, as he recounted the various houses we had lived in and the rooms we shared over the years. I had no idea why he was bringing any of this up at this particular moment. He continued in this manner, and I began to just be able to make out the memory that had moments before been triggered at the table and was slowly coming into focus. It was a series of short scenes, mostly in an apartment my parents rented when I was around three or four years old. Some of them were of places I could not quite make out, but I assumed they represented my grandparents' old house and the daycare center I once attended. They were old memories of old places. Before I could make these images more concrete and begin to try to remember their significance, I was ripped from my trance-like state by something my brother said. He was asking me if I remembered his imaginary friend. He said he used to think it was his guardian angel. I, myself, was around nine when he used to talk about this imaginary friend and I tended to just ignore him when he spoke about it. I did remember, however, a time when I awoke to the sound of my brother whispering. I remember rolling over so that I could smack him and tell him to go to sleep, but immediately being startled by the sound of a deep, raspy voice that seemed to be responding to him. I must have blocked it out, but at that moment I could suddenly recall that night. I ran straight into our parents' room waking them up and going on and on about a man in our room. Unfortunately, when my parents finally got up and went to investigate, my brother was sound asleep. 
and nothing was amiss. The window was closed and locked, the bed was clear underneath, and our closet only housed a few sweatshirts and board games. As this was all coming back to me, my own memory began to sharpen and reveal itself. It was as if a movie was being played on fast-forward of select moments from my early childhood. As an only child for the first few years of my life, it was not uncommon for me to have to settle on entertaining myself. Strangely enough, though, in the images streaming through my brain, a figure began to materialize. Frame by frame, as the scenes repeated themselves over and over again, a growing dark mist or smoke was taking shape. Christian had lost his temporary state of calmness and returned to sobbing uncontrollably, but the images continued to hold my attention. What was that thing in each of the scenes with me? Why did I feel some connection to it? The sobs of my brother grew into full-on wailing. Still, I could not be brought out of my current state. I had to know what my memory was trying to show me. At some point, my curiosity began to change to an all-too-familiar feeling of dread. I was coming to the realization that I knew exactly what was in those rooms with me. I had always known. I did not want to see it in its full form, but I could not look away. The images were in my head, not in front of my eyes. I could feel tears streaming once again down my cold, clammy face. I was sweating profusely and shivering uncontrollably like one continuous chill running up and down my spine. It started with that unmistakable stench. It seemed to roll off of him like the smoke that surrounded his presence. Then I saw that hideously familiar naked body with all of its twists and inhuman angles. I could hear a faint noise rising from somewhere in the background. No, it was welling up from inside me. I was screaming. The last thing I remembered before blacking out was that ungodly face, crooked and ghastly, somehow smiling without a mouth and seeing right into my soul with non-existent eyes. And to think, I now can vividly remember that three-year-old me used to be comforted by this hideous creature. He was, after all, my guardian angel.